Uh, yeah. Uh, family, y'all. Just keep it tight, keep it tight, keep it tight. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go, here we go. Uh. So, to be perfectly honest, I am not of Catholic background. Um, by any stretch of the imagination. So this has been fun. So when you guys make Catholic jokes, I just kind of nod and laugh. <laughs> and nobody really sees me kind of confused. And then, you know, maybe ask my uncle and aunt later. <laughs> um, so um, when I got assigned this, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into. That's okay, because I lived with two, uh, two of my roommates. Went to your Christian university. That's why I have a stack of books over there. Um, I walked in and they gave me four books. One of my friends actually read John in the Greek, like in, so in Greek. Um, so I used her too. Anyway, uh, <laughs> who knew that chapter 6 had all of these miracles that I've been learning about, or have been learning about? Um, so Jesus feeds the 5,000. That's why we've got three fish to represent the 5,000, right? It's a pretty, you know, widely known miracle. That's the thing with these miracles in here, is that everybody essentially knows them. Uh, you know, a boy with five small barley loaves. He just, he took the loaves and he gave thanks for them. And it, the, way, the way that I interpret it when I read it is that it was very casual. He was not stressed about it at all. You know, having this group of people come to him and being hungry and not knowing, nobody knew how to feed them. And he was totally fine with it. And he gave thanks and he passed out all the bread and all the, the fish. And, um, it was fine. It was fine. So how did how did the people respond? Uh, they tried to make him their king um, because this this miracle, right, is a big deal. They took it as like ah, <laughs> and they tried to uh, tried to crown him. Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And um, Jesus, this is Jesus, and these are the people, and this is the crown, and they're trying trying to lift him up, right. They're trying to put him up because he did this miracle and this, this great thing that nobody could ever you know, see him do. And he said nothing <laughs> in so many words. And he went off to the mountain by himself. And then Jesus walks on water. Like maybe he was walking beside the sea instead of literally on the water. Um, as the disciples saw him from the boat. Which is why I put, I put some coast here for us just to keep our minds open. You know, that might have happened. And the biggest deal, one of the biggest deals, is uh, Jesus telling the people that he is the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And he says this over and over again, I am, I am. Um, which is why we've got that big, beautiful loaf of bread. <coughs> what does that mean to say that I am the bread of life? How do the people respond? What do you do when I tell you I am the bread of life? Are you going to try and take a bite out of me? Thanks for you. <laughs> is, that what they, that's, is that what they thought? You know, what, right. what do we do with this? Back to the literal, um, the literal sense of of being the the embodiment of of this higher something, right? Okay. So he said, "Whoever eats of me will hunger for more and will thirst for more." He said, "I am. I am." Not describing who he is, but what he does. Uh, essentially, that he nourishes with a bread that produces life. Life giving nourishment um, that was once provided by the Torah. So, like this, um, oh, and what I completely forgot to mention earlier is that all of this happened in a uh, like, near Jewish Passover. So, why is that important? Why would that be important? You know, we've had some references in future or earlier chapters about Exodus and Moses on this old time, this old law, right? So, it's all, it's all coming together, right guys? So when I was reading this with the text and then with my Christian friends and um, with all of this together, I took it as, you know, not literally that Deacon Cleo gets to fire me and gets life, right? It's this nourishment, it's this soul nourishment. Um, which is what he's trying to tell the people. But, you know, they're, they're sort of outraged, they're sort of confused, they're sort of, like, what do you mean you're telling me you're the bread of life? How does that work? Just how? Um, and the disciples, I think, are a little bit beside themselves as well. They drew back and no longer went about with them. 
what is Jesus doing when he's doing these miracles? What's, what's his purpose? What's his role? You know, to reveal God to humanity by revealing himself, by um, presenting health and sustenance and then offering them life in this sort of obscure way. Where he, I mean, when I was reading this, in my so many <laughs> versions of the Bible that I was given, um, they ask, how can we, how can we get this life, or how can we, you know, without taking a child out of you, you know, how, what does this mean, how do we do this? It's, it's, a, it's a symbolism, it's a language about it. It's, it's not to be taken so literal. So, like, <coughs> Jesus, in all of this, is to prove, um, to prove that Jesus has divine power by performing these miracles. Um, you know, the language and translations and everything, I mean, it, I mean, it goes back to what we've been talking about. Faith, and we believe them, and how we believe them, and we have to take into consideration the people that were there um, in all of these miracles. And, you know, this proof. And we've had some, some sort of circling discussion around being skeptical, like the, even the, the Jews in, in chapter 5 are skeptical. Everybody's been skeptical. Everybody's been like, who is this man? And my friend, who's actually read the whole uh, chapter in Greek, she <laughs> exclaimed, how cruel. You know, the, the Jews have been through a lot. Everybody's been through a lot. And now we have this man coming in, telling us that, we're, that he's this and he's that. And some of them didn't believe him. You know, and the humanness that comes with that, <coughs> but not believing that. But, you know, there's a history to that. Also, <coughs> the uh, sort of reference to like Old Testament and Exodus, and Moses, and the commandments, and the role of, of idolatry, I suppose, in, in the Old Testament, how they weren't supposed to have idols, and how um, how prayer was done, and who was allowed to enter, I guess, the temple. You know, it was very, it was a very holy procession. You couldn't just be anyone and walk in and pray. Like, you couldn't just pray at home by yourself. It was, there was a whole bunch to that. And Jesus coming in, being so casual about everything, Threw everyone off, right? It's like, how, how can I have this relationship with Jesus being God or being the physical version of God in front of me? Someone I can touch, someone who will touch me. What did that do to all this other previous thought about the Old Testament? Right? So, that's sort of what I got from chapter 6. Very good, Sarah. Thank you. So chapter 6, I love this visual representation that we have of chapter 6 because it really sums up the key events. And two of the key events were nature miracles. How it is that if Jesus is God, John is trying to show us that anything that God can do, Jesus can do. With uh, the multiplication of the loaves and with the walking on water, it's showing how it is that Jesus isn't like the rest of us. Right? Vincent, we love him dearly, but let's see you walk on water. None of us here can walk on water. Jesus could walk on water. He was somehow different from the rest of us. So these nature miracles that were to show how different he was, the people want to crown him king. He runs out into the wilderness. And then the chapter concludes with this bread of life discourse. Two of the key words for us in English are, I am. Because in the Gospel of John, Jesus says different times, I am. And then he tells us who he is. He illuminates, going back to that light and darkness, the luminous mysteries. He's illuminating who he is for us. So it's in the Gospel of John that we have all those great phrases. I am the good shepherd. I am the sheep gate. I am the light of the world. I am the vine. All that's the Gospel of John. What do we have in chapter 6? I am the bread of life. If John was written somewhere between 90 and 100 A.D. and then edited about 110, what that means is that St. Paul had written 50 years earlier about the Last Supper event where Jesus took a loaf of bread and said, this is my body, take and eat. So we have at least 40 to 50 years that people were sharing bread in Jesus' name with this, with this theology, this belief that came from St. Paul. He took this bread and said, what? This is my <coughs> body. So Christians are interpreting this, and after 40 or 50 years of interpreting, this is my body. But I'm holding it looks like bread. But it's Jesus' body. So we have different people coming to this conclusion about how it is that Jesus is. The bread that I hold in my hand? Jesus is the bread 
of life. He nourishes my soul in the same way that this bread nourishes my body. Can you imagine living without eating? Have you tried going a few days without eating? Your stomach starts to growl, you're hungry, and you need food. In the same way, Jesus is not physical nourishment, but he's <coughs> nourishment for our spirits. Was that easy to accept, as Sierra so well pointed out? Don't munch on me, did you say? Well, yeah, don't, don't bite me. <laughs> don't bite me, right? Different people, according to this chapter, at the end of the chapter, we have people saying, this is just too crazy. It's incredible. The word incredible really means in English, unbelievable. What he's saying is unbelievable. That he, that we're supposed to like eat his flesh to have life, it's unbelievable. It's incredible. <coughs> Who can believe what this guy is saying? And so the chapter concludes with many departing from him. Many people had followed him. Oh, oh, this is great. Look at this. He does all sorts of magic tricks. We want to make him king. He starts saying crazy things, and suddenly what happens to the people? We are out of there. This is too much. This is crazy. He is smoking some bad crap. You can look at it as the bread of life is a nourishment spiritually. Spirit, spiritual. Because uh, we, I mean, I'm guilty of it. I mean, I go to church on Sundays, sometimes I miss, sometimes I don't miss. But it's just, when you say the bread of life is that you have to have it nourishment, you have to have that spiritual. Yes, I will have it outside that door, outside the church doors, but I still have to come into church to receive spiritually again. But why, once I leave church, I don't feel the spirit. But when I do go to church, I feel it. So what he's saying in the prayer of life is that you have to have it in you all the time. That's, that's what I'm saying, that you have to... In the same way that we keep eating every day, we're eating something. You have again. to have food to keep the nourishment going, so you have to have spiritual in you. Could you imagine doing something? You eat every day, but you only nourish yourself spiritually once a week. Yikes. And as Sierra points out, there are different ways that a person can interpret that. We can interpret it literally, of course. There could be a literal meaning to what Jesus said. There's also a symbolic meaning. Literally, those who have a somatic view of the real presence of Christ are those who believe that the bread that we have on Sunday at Mass is literally Jesus' body. Jesus jumps down from a cloud somewhere into that bread. That bread is really Jesus' body. You are munching Jesus' bones when you eat the, when you eat the bread. That's, a, very, that's the, uh, a theology of the somatic real presence. But of course, we know that there are different theologies so that many of our non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters, Baptists, Methodists, all sorts of churches, they're not so literal in their interpretation. It's more symbolic. When we get together, it's a symbol of our unity and a symbol of our desire to nourish ourselves with the Word and with Christ. The homebound, take that bread of life, literally, because they long for that. Uh, it's a way for them to to exist. You know, they, they look on it as uh, it's a bread of life, literally. You know, just, you, they you long for it. You can imagine holding Jesus in your hand for a moment, or having Christ that close. I mean, there's something very beautiful about that Eucharistic theology. Something very comforting about that. But there's also a challenge that comes with that too, because once we eat the body of Christ, what does that mean? Christ is inside us. Now we have to be Christ. That's right. Now we have to be Christ. You are what you eat. Wait a minute. You just ate Christ. Now it's time to be Christ. Saint Augustine was beautifully said: "Become what you receive. You receive the body of Christ. Now it's for you all to become the body of Christ." I was thinking of the, uh, the moment to let go, like when parents let you go and make your mistakes and find your life and mm -hmm. struggle was like, they try to prepare you. I think was, that's what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. She let go of the disciples, go up there and 
There comes a point in all our lives where we have to let go. We try to raise our children the best that we can, but let's just be honest, at the end of the day, they're going to make their own decisions. Once they grow to a certain point, we'd like to help influence those decisions. Psalm 127 says, children are like arrows in the hand of the warrior. Are arrows meant to stay in your hand forever? Sorry, you got to let go and let them fly at some point. Arrows are like, children are like arrows in the hand of the warrior. Got news for you, got to let go. Let them fly. I've got one that's like a boomerang. <laughs> <laughs>